This half hour, we'll be talking the antitrust lawsuit the the DOJ uh, brought against Google. I've got two guests on the phone. We have Alex Mozed, founder, CEO of Applico, a platform advisory firm, uh, and Kara Marciscano, who's a senior analyst at Wisdom Tree, also a registered representative of Foresight Fund Services. Uh, Alex, thank you. And Kara, thanks for joining us on Behind the Markets. Great to be here. Um, so uh, we should we should quickly mention Alex. You know, I we at Wisdom Tree licensed some of your data on platforms for an index. Um, before we get into all of the stuff going on, you wrote a book, Modern Monopolies, very timely conversation on the sort of antitrust suits here on, on calling them monopolies. What's you know maybe give us a, a brief sense why platform companies, and then let's get into the sort of the current events here. Yeah, the the book was aptly named Modern Monopolies because these platforms have a winner-take-all business model. They have uh, two-sided network effects. They have consumers on one side, producers on the other, otherwise known as many suppliers. Uh, and because these these two different sides of the ecosystem feed off of each other, the, the natural endpoint is to only have one or two dominant players in a given vertical. And, and now, you know, when you think about the monopoly uh, traditional regulations and, and sort of harming consumers thinking these monopolies are going to raise prices. How does that fit into Google, which basically arguably gives its products away for free? Yeah, that's the, that's the that's the classic trick in the book is they give all their they give so much free software, free value away to the consumer, to the demand side of the equation. And that's because they create value by facilitating the exchange of value. Uh, so they want as much demand as they can get, which means in the eyes of the consumer, there's all this free stuff. And where platforms take advantage of customers is not the consumer as a customer, it's actually of the supplier as a customer. And that is the big difference, and that is what the DOJ has missed here for years, and the EU has missed it as well for a while. The EU is starting to pick up on this, that platforms actually have two customer groups. A consumer is a customer, but the producer, the supplier is a customer as well. So for Google, those are third-party websites. And who pays Google money? People buying ads. And so when Google crams down other third-party websites from appearing in organic search results, they charge rent to those websites who have to buy ads from Google to appear in the results and stay relevant. They're also sort of being brought up in a lot of the election-oriented news, um, whether it's uh, Google, I, I hear, has been getting involved in some of the local elections. The, Twitter is, 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 is out there on some of the, the political things saying, you know, sort of not making links available to certain news stories. Anything that you think from these recent events that are going to cause new regulations against some of these big tech companies like Twitter and Google? Yeah, and that's where the 230, the Section 230 stuff comes in, where we've now heard, um, actually, Clarence Thomas in the Supreme Court just had a 10-page memo where he was saying that they might uh, be looking at kind of uh, diluting some of the power, uh, power of immunity that was given to these tech companies under Section 230. And what that basically means is when people publish, uh, you know, inventory, whether that's content or products or, you know, posts, on these platform uh, ecosystems, the platform is immune from being responsible if there's infringing or inappropriate content there um, to a certain degree. And what we've seen is the platforms are now being very, uh, very liberal in how they regulate uh, what content is made available by taking action and penalizing producers or content creators, right? There's one end of the spectrum, which is taking down posts. The other end of the spectrum is, you know, banning users, shutting down their accounts, shadow banning their posts. And what we've seen is these, these content platforms in particular be much more aggressive in their moderation and, 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 and dancing the line of are they really just a neutral platform or are they now really a kind of content curator and publisher? And what does that mean in the eyes of 230? Uh, I think that's the conversation that's happening. I think it's appropriate uh, with some guardrails, uh, which we can get into. Great. Sure, so, you know, taking a, a step back to the case brought against Google, so the case is essentially arguing that the deals that Google is involved in um, to be the default search en engine is anti-competitive, right? But it seems like the argument isn't nuanced 
and attuned to that two-sided business model that you talked about at the top of the show. Um, how is Google competing with, you know, not necessarily computer c- consumers, but with suppliers? And are there specific ab- examples where Google has been anti-competitive against its suppliers? Yeah, so I, I can tell you the Google General Counsel, the whole team there, they're high-fiving each other right now. They, they're popping champagne. They're very excited about this case the DOJ just brought. And it's actually a huge letdown. I'm very disappointed in Bill Barr um, and the whole team of the DOJ for what they've done. They basically just copycatted what they did 25 years ago to Microsoft. They, they copycatted what the EU did five years ago against Google. EU brought this same case against Google. And um, they have now come out and said, you know, we actually kind of messed this up. And the competitive search engines, the CEO of DuckDuckGo just came out and said, the, the, the search engine auction system, which is what Google has now implemented in Europe, um, actually doesn't help us. So it's kind of all for naught. We're going to have years and years of, uh, of um, legislation or, or of, of uh, lawsuits back and forth here on this. And then maybe you'll get a few billion dollar settlement and a slap on the back. But they completely miss what you were getting at there, Kara, around um, where does the platform make its money and how does it apply its competitive pressure? And that is against suppliers. So think about websites like Yelp, TripAdvisor, Expedia, Booking.com, and there's, there's countless others. The House Judiciary Committee just a few weeks ago released a report looking at Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook, and how they take advantage of you know, their market power, with, with a lot of emphasis looking at how they take advantage of suppliers. So there are countless testimony here from websites that have said Google is vertically integrating, and they're actually ripping our content. They're competing unfairly against us. If you search for a hotel booking, you know, now, 2020, you have to have three scrolls down on your on your computer before you see organic listings right which is rendering Expedia and booking and all these other uh, third-party websites basically useless unless they pay the 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 gatekeeper that is Google search this is a great example of vertical integration that is at the expense of the supplier the third-party website the producer and it enriches the platform and yes you could say it conversely limits consumer choice but but you don't, by, that's a distraction. All you need to say is Expedia and Booking are customers of Google. Google has over 70% market share, clearly, from advertising in, in search. And they're using their market power unfairly to jack up rates and rent and charges and fees on their customers, these third-party websites. And these third-party websites have been very vocal. But they can't compete, and it's unfair. Yet the DOJ decided to not even look at any of that, which is what the EU has said their next case will probably look at that. But the DOJ instead tried to play, tried to play it safe here, and they're going to be caught up uh, arguing this thing for years, and it's not going to make any true difference on how Google operates. We're talking with Alex Mosed, who's CEO of Applico, Kara Marciscano, who's a senior officer at Wisdom Tree. I'm Jeremy Schwartz. Uh, Alex, it's, it's interesting. It, what, one of the things that makes these companies so hard is it's not like a lot of other of the major tech companies haven't tried to build search engines to compete with Google. I mean, Microsoft has thrown a lot of money. Uh, Amazon's thrown money. You've had a lot of tried to competitors, but it goes to how you know these algorithms that just keep getting better and better and better with more data that runs through their systems, and it's like hard to then come up with a better algorithm than Google? Is that the sort of natural monopoly nature that you talk about that sort of feeds into why these companies are so strong and tough to compete with? Yeah, you have, you have, uh, you have the chicken and egg problem. You have two-sided network effects, right? As you get more demand, it helps you get more supply, and then more supply helps you get more demand. And now you have a lot of websites that are, you know, that are uh, building their websites in such a way that they are giving extra data to Google's search engine crawlers. And just the, you know, Bing from Microsoft is actually what DuckDuckGo is built on top of. DuckDuckGo doesn't have its own search engine. Um, and Bing, I don't think, is, is still isn't profitable. So um, you have a winner-take-all dynamic where you're investing so much to just get to some point of initial critical mass that until you really are that dominant player, particularly in search, <clears throat> you're going to be losing money. 
there's not room for three or four uh, different search engine businesses, which is kind of like what the DOJ is trying to say. Oh, well, if we prevented Google from using its its market uh, power to bully its way to be the default search engine, well, then it would open up room to have three or four different search engines. It's just not, it's just not in the realm of reality. They, they just don't understand how these business models work at a fundamental level. Um, and it's, it's pretty disappointing to see, frankly. So the, the stock of Google hasn't even really reacted negatively this week. It's up 6%, um, which I think signifies, you know, exactly the disappointment you were talking about and the fact that the case just isn't as strong as it could be. And it actually seems to be removing maybe some regulatory risk off the table for, for Google. And I have seen, you know, a few articles saying that if the ultimate outcome of the case is that Google can no longer pay companies like Apple to direct traffic to its search engine, it could actually be a benefit to Google because that's a huge expense for them, what they pay Apple to be the default search engine on the on the Apple iPhone. Just curious if you think that this could actually end up being something good for Google in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. They just they just sidestepped any real threat of antitrust action for the next five plus years. They're going to be bogged down in court. DOJ is going to be focused on this for years. Oh, and by the way, Google knows how to fight this lawsuit better because they've already been through it with the EU. So they now have all the learnings of how to fight this thing a second time around. So whatever mistakes they might have made the first time around, they're not going to make them a second time. So the DOJ has an even harder battle to fight here for even less reward or, or less ability to make to to actually try to neutralize any anti-competitive behavior by the dominant platform monopoly and um it just exposes their their blatant ignorance around how these business models work and not only for google but if i'm amazon which i think amazon actually has the most google and amazon have the most antitrust risk in my opinion if i'm amazon and i see the 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 tack that the doj took on google I'm also ex- elated at this point. Um, the EU finally has the most, I'd say, educated opinion about this, um, and it's taken them years to hone it, but they've been open with, with their thinking on it, and just the DOJ, I guess, doesn't want to, uh, to embrace you know, some of the feedback their peers across, you know, across the Atlantic have been saying. In, in other platform news this week, Alex, uh, maybe we come back to this story, but you know, it, it seems like other platforms were also, uh, I, I think I saw some headlines even today on Uber and Lyft, two other you know, uh, auto companies or the ride sharing. Uh, and you know, they, they, they've been in battles over, are there, are there employees actually drivers? I think California is coming out and saying you have to reclassify these drivers as employees. Do you see maybe you know, that coming a bigger risk to those types of, of companies? Um. You know, all of these cases, there's two central gripes of suppliers and producers. One, (laughs) what happens if the platform penalizes me, right? If they kick me off, if they, you know, uh, uh, shadow ban me, if they put my account on probation, right? If I'm an Uber driver and you kick me off, I don't have any forum. I don't have any ability to rebut that or, or tell my side of the story. Similarly, if you're a website and Google you know, demonetizes you, which they've done, um, you don't have any recourse. And, that, and now your whole business is in deep trouble or your whole livelihood if you're an independent driver. I mean, what are you going to do? You've built a profile. You've built a history. So there's no due process or recourse for producers uh, on these large tech monopolies. That's the first gripe. The second gripe is when the platform just raises their rent on you and you can't do anything, right? You're a seller on Amazon. Holiday season is here. They say, instead of 15%, I'm charging you 25. Uh, Google search says, well, I'm not going to put you on the second page of organic listings. You're going to be on the third, and now you've got to buy more ads for me. Um, you have no recourse in that scenario either. And this uh, California AB5 law does absolutely nothing to solve either of those two gripes of Uber drivers. All it really does is help California get more uh, taxes from Uber. And it makes sure that independent contractors 
don't skirt paying their portion of income tax, and it makes sure that the business is paying that tax directly to the state, and it helps California get more money, but they get to look like they're doing a good thing for the drivers when instead they're actually hurting the independent contractor industry, and they're forcing businesses either out of business or to move to just other states and not operate in California anymore. So it's all just misguided um, you know, I think it's more done for show and, and for their own personal gain that is getting more uh, tax revenue rather than actually saying, what are the problems that these producers have and how can I solve that? Um, and classifying them as, as employees doesn't solve it. Now, one of the last times we had you on the show, we talked about another platform. Well, actually, a company that's often considered a platform, but that you say is not. A report earnings this week had some trouble. Uh, sort of Netflix is one of these companies that's in the content space. Uh, talk about your view on Netflix and, uh, and, and its long-term issues. They don't have supply-side network effects. They can have five of some of the biggest companies of the world come not only into their backyard but come right into their business domain in a year and get 60-plus million subscribers. That's Disney+. Plus. Not even to mention what Apple is doing, Amazon, Google, AT&T, Time Warner, HBO, Comcast. These are big companies. And which one would you rather own, Netflix or YouTube? I'm taking YouTube every day of the week. And so when you look at Netflix's multiples, they could still have a good business. They could still hit their growth numbers. But the question is, do they deserve to have a roughly 2.5x PE multiple than what Disney has? Do they deserve to have such a huge valuation when they actually don't have a moat? Anyone can go and buy supply. That's what Netflix's business is. There's no supply-side network effect. right? You want to compete with YouTube, Vimeo tried this, IAC. Barry Diller understands marketplaces very, very well. They started Tinder. They own Match.com. They own Expedia. They own Angie's List and Handy and home service you know, marketplaces. They could not compete against YouTube because to be successful, you need to convince millions of content creators to bring their content to your platform. That is very difficult to do, where instead, uh, when you have these linear streaming, streaming services, it's really who's just going to pay $500 million to go get South Park? And who's going to pay enough money to, to go get anchor content and then you can go, you know, produce your own content around that. There's no supply-side network effect there. And to convince suppliers to come over, you need to get a certain amount of demand. And that is the chicken and egg problem, which makes it so hard for a platform to reach that critical mass and that monopoly power. But when you do reach the monopoly power, it, it affords you the highest profit margins out of any business model. And appropriately so, gives you the highest multiple of any business model. Um, Netflix has platform multiples, but no platform business model. And I think the next few years for them are going to be a very different model um, as we look at their competitive positioning. We're in our final minute here, Alex. Uh, you know, a lot of good good topics. If people want to stay in touch with platform views, as you think about I mean, this is one of the big, we think, economic uh, sort of business model type that's very different than the sort of standard model. Uh, how, how can people stay in touch with what you're working on besides your book, Modern Monopolies, to get some background on the platform companies? What are the different things that you're doing um, to talk about these platform companies? My show, Winner Take All, we've got a video podcast, and uh, we've loved to have Kara on there before, and we talk about how these large tech monopolies are competing against the, the traditional incumbents on a, on a, on a regular basis. Uh, so it's been great to be here. And um, and then you can also just go see what Plaid is doing. Up now, what, over 50% since it launched May of 2019. These platform businesses are just getting started. And although it seems they couldn't go higher, trust me, COVID is only an accelerant, and they are going to continue to to grow and, and, and have very aggressive growth. Yeah, and, and for Wisdom Truth Perspective, Kara does a lot of our work on things like uh, sort of the, the, the platform type companies, cloud computing. She's uh, one of our big experts on uh, on technology. So, thank Kara, thanks for joining us for some commentary to start the show. Alex, always a, a pleasure to talk to you.